um, a little bit about our other activities. Oh, I should tell one other story. I sort of unrelated. Um, I was just in Chile about a month and a half ago on a recon trip with engineers who surveyed the damage. And um, one of the gentlemen was from Chile, a young engineer in his 40s, and looked, looked like he was Chilean, a little bit Armenian. So he saw that I was Armenian, and I, I said, yeah, I'm Armenian. He says, well, he says, my great-grandmother was Armenian. I said, how can that be? He says, his great-grandfather picked her out of an orphanage when she was 14 and married her. So that's another genocide survivor story from an orphanage. Before I introduce the speaker, a few things. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Meg, Maggie Goshen for arranging all this on short notice and making it all happen. So thank you very much, Maggie. And as many of you know, we're very much associated with Nasser, and so there's some kind of handout from Nasser, and we do a lot of, a lot of things with Nasser, and, all, and uh, so we co-sponsor, and they're pretty actively involved in our activities. We also have a handout for tomorrow at 4 o'clock. It's very unusual we have two doings um, the same weekend, but this weekend we do. So tomorrow at 4 o'clock, Dr. Martin Denarian on um, the Miracle Man of the Western Front, the doctor that started plastic surgery. And um, one of his protégés will be giving the talk. So that's tomorrow at 4 o'clock. So without any further um, um, introductions, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, orphans of the Genocide is uh, Misak Kalechian, who uh, resides in California and in Beirut. He is a graduate of the uh, Wilson College of Technology in the UK, and uh, he works for a Silicon Valley company, and he's the director of international operations. He's an independent researcher, and I asked him how he got involved in this, and I'll let him explain it, but um, it's pretty unusual for an engineer to go this far from his usual work. But he takes it very seriously, as engineers do. Um, he will talk for approximately one hour, and we'll have some questions and answers, and then with refreshments and time to meet the speaker and talk and, uh, and just uh, exchange stories. So without any further ado, please stop go ahead. Thank you for being here. The New York Times, August 1901, Turkish ex-consul asserts that the Ottoman Sultan intends to exterminate the race by a regular system. London, August 30th, the Daily Mail published today an article written by Ali Nuri Bey, ex-Turkish consul of Rotterdam, asserting that the massacres of Armenians, which has just recommenced, is part of a regular system of extermination. He says, the number of Armenians killed will depend upon the outcry raised in Europe and pressure brought to bear upon the Sultan. The same horrible process will be repeated year by year until all are killed. So as you can see, this is a, a pattern which has even happened before 1915. After the 1915 genocide, the return of Armenian orphans back to their normal lives was horrifying. After witnessing their parents being killed, raped, slaughtered, and banished, they were left to feel abandoned, lonely, vulnerable, and homeless. The American Near East Relief Organization is credited with the saving of million lives in the Near East, consisting of people of variety of ethnic origin, including Armenian, Arabs, Greeks, Assyrians, Persians, and others. Near East Relief is also praised for having cared for 132,556 Armenian orphans scattered across the region between Armenia to Constantinople, between Greece, Beirut, Damascus, and Jerusalem. Near East Relief was an act of philanthropy, which in the words of the American historian Howard Zacher, Near East Relief quite literally kept an entire Armenian nation alive. And shortly you're gonna be seeing on a footage 
what that means. Since 2005, I have been researching the activities of Near East Relief Operations during the atrocities of the period from 19, between 1915 and 1930. I also have published several articles about the organization and its selfless, consistent support to the minorities in the region, in the Astag Daily in Beirut, and I have even shared them in the past at the Haigazian University in Lebanon. However, after five years of chasing names, places, people, and events to make sense of the Armenian reality during 1915 and 1930, coming across an authentic German documentary film that actually told and validated the history and the story of my findings in actual live film frames was a dreamlike and a humbling experience. I was actually looking at a historic documentary that was approved beyond shadow of the doubt. What took place during that period in the first section, you are about to see one of my research material, a carpet woven by Armenian orphans in Ghazir, Lebanon, and donated to the White House in the United States. This finding was published early in the Armenian Astar Daily, broadcast on Future TV, in Lebanon, both in Armenian and English, and reported even on CNN International. In the second section, you are about to see turkification of over 1,000 Armenian children at Aintura College in Lebanon by Jamal Pasha and Ali Beedi. In the third section, you are about to see a German documentary partially filmed in Lebanon showing the reality of the Armenian refugees as they arrived in Lebanon in Syria, Greece, Aleppo, Jerusalem, where they were welcomed and protected by the local governments and the communities. This was broadcast on 2005 on CNN. Next is the story of a rug, a rug that had roots in the controversial feelings of Armenians back in 1915. Details on this from Future TV in Lebanon. When this picture was taken in December 1925, the main feature was not U.S. President Calvin Coolidge on the left-hand side, but the carpet these officials were showing off. What makes this rock special? The 4 by 6 meter rock had just crossed two oceans, arriving from a tiny Lebanese village, where it was hand-woven by Armenian orphans as a token of gratitude to the U.S. The 1915 Armenian Genocide cost more than a million lives and a mass exodus to surrounding countries, notably Syria and Lebanon. Among the thousands of Armenians that settled in Lebanon were some 132,000 orphans. This was the first home to 1,400 Armenian orphans. But this orphanage, one of many funded by the U.S.'s Near East Relief, later moved to the mountainous village of Hazir, north of the capital. According to Misak Kalejan, a researcher of Armenian history, the U.S. government had provided 91 million U.S. dollars in donations and about 25 million dollars worth of food supplies for all the Armenian orphans in Lebanon. In 1925, the orphanage received enough money by the Near East Relief to purchase four weaving machines. In less than 10 years, the girls at the Hazir Orphanage wove 3,240 rugs, but the largest by far was the one which made its way to the White House. It was taken from a German in Dresden, and it was copied from there. But the idea is there are 144 animals on that carpet. The idea is because uh, where Armenia and Mount Ararat and Van is what you call is where Garden of Eden was, according to the Bible. Every first Sunday of December, the Near East Relief Association organized what was dubbed as Golden Rule Day, dedicated to raising donations. It is exactly here that this picture was taken over six decades ago. Donations helped thousands of orphans become the pillar of the Armenian community in Lebanon, allowing Hazir to blossom into an integral part of the country's Armenian heritage. Please remember this water fountain that she's sitting on, because later on you will see why. Sarah Khouri, Future Television, Hazir. Hundreds of thousands of Armenians 
were killed by Ottoman Turks during the 1915 Armenian Genocide, a massacre which remains a controversial issue with some countries still not acknowledging the mass murder as genocide. Many Armenians fled to neighboring countries, notably Syria and Lebanon. Some 132,000 of those who settled in and around Beirut were orphans who witnessed the murders of loved ones and found themselves stripped from any kind of belonging. Due to this mass, mass exodus, orphans were set up across Lebanon. One orphanage made headlines with an extraordinary story of a rug which reached the White House in Washington. When this picture was taken in December 1925, the main feature was not U.S. President Calvin Coolidge on the left-hand side, but the carpet these officials were showing off. What makes this rug special? The 4 by 6 meter rug had just crossed two oceans, arriving from a tiny Lebanese village, where it was hand-woven by Armenian orphans as a token of gratitude to the U.S. But this orphanage, one of many funded by the U.S.'s Near East Relief, later moved to the mountainous village of Hazir, north of the capital. According to Misa Kalejian, a researcher of Armenian history, the U.S. government had provided 91 million U.S. dollars in donations and about 25 million dollars worth of food supplies for all the Armenian orphans in Lebanon. The orphanage was headed by Swiss missionaries Jacob Konsler and his wife. Uh, because they came at, to a certain age where they had to leave and look after their own life, and as an Armenian tradition, they were afraid that these girls, if they were used as maids in houses, they would they they, they might be abused. So uh, an Armenian guy called Ovanes Tashjan came with the idea to uh, Jacob Kunzler that uh, why don't we just provide work to this girl? In 1925, the orphanage received enough money by the Near East Relief to purchase four weaving machines, while the following year, the provisions for these machines increased to $25,000. You can see an orphan girl without hands. She, does, she doesn't have any hands. And she is, she's using her own feet to weave wool and cotton. Basically, it shows the situation how the Armenian people who, from the genocide, they do everything they can for survival. In less than 10 years, the girls at the Hazir orphanage wove 3,240 rugs, but the largest by far was the one which made its way to the White House. It took 10 months, six girls, they, they switched three by three. The rug consists of four and a half, uh, a million knots. Even though the rug's design was inspired by a painting from Germany, it reflected Armenia's historical White heritage. House. It was taken from a German museum in Dresden, and it was copied from there. But the idea is there are 144 animals on that carpet. The idea is because uh, where Armenia and Mount Ararat and Van is, what you call is where the Garden of Eden was, according to the Bible. Every first Sunday of December, the Near East <coughs> Relief Association organized what was dubbed as Golden Rule Day, dedicated to raising donations. In 1925, due to massive media coverage of the rug and the visit to Washington by some of the orphans who met with President Coolidge, donations reached four million dollars. It is exactly here that this picture was taken over six decades ago. Donations help thousands of orphans become the pillar of the Armenian community in Lebanon, allowing Hazir to blossom into an integral part of the country's Armenian heritage. Sara Khouri, Future Television, Hazir. Certification of Armenian children. <coughs> when I found the location in 2005, I had a special... Rishan, a researcher in Armenian history. Jamal Pasha, the Turkish military leader and commander of the Ottoman army in Syria, came to Lebanon in a bid to repatriate some Armenian orphans to Turkish nationals. Sarah Huri reports on Pasha's short-lived plan. Orphans who fled to Lebanon during the 1915 Armenian genocide executed by the Ottoman authorities did not only have to deal with the traumas of war and losing loved ones, 
but it was recently learned that some of the mastermind jurors of the failed ethnic cleansing tracked down some of the orphans and able to repatriate them to Turkish nationals and convert them to Islam. Nisa Kalishan, who discovered this new revelation and who is a researcher in Armenian history, said his quest began when he tumbled over a picture of Jamal Pasha on the steps of the French college in the Lebanese village of Antura. During the First World War, uh, the, the Turks uh, occupied the school and converted to a Turkish orphanage. But the residents of the Turkish orf uh, orphanage were, according to archives, 1,200 orphans consisting of 1,000 Armenians and 200 uh, Kurds and Turkish. And their names uh, were Turkified, the boys were cir uh, circumcised, and they were taught absolute uh, uh, Turkish traditions, uh, religion, and everything else uh, associated with Turkey. Kelly Shaw explains how the names of the orphans were changed while keeping their primary initials. Hampartun uh, Najarian became Hamid Nasi. I have found records where uh, in memoirs they mentioned that not only they had names, also they had numbers. It's kind of remember, uh, reminds us of uh, uh, what happened in Auschwitz and uh, given numbers or tattooed. Teaching at the orphanage was in Turkish. Old orphans were trained in trading, such as shoemaking and carpentry, among others. The mullah assigned the children to pray five times a day. At night, the band used to play long live Jamal Pasha. But as poor sanitary conditions, lack of nourishment and diseases prevailed in the school, some 300 Armenian orphans died. Kedishal said that those children were not properly buried, making their remains vulnerable to wild animals. According to Kedishal, due to the restricted amount of food given to the children, they would run away into nearby forests to pick apples. Some of them were running at night through the forest to go and pick up apples. They will hit uh, skulls and bones. And even some of the, uh, the family's soul was so much that uh, the kids had to grind uh, whatever bones they used to uh, find and eat bones, according to the memoirs that I uh, read. Following the end of the three-year Turkish tutelage over the orphanage and as Turkish troops withdrew from Lebanon, the French and the British took over the orphanage, bringing it back to its original form, with the children retrieving their Armenian names and religion. Up to this day, the Turkish government denies the execution of the Armenian genocide, but the event in which one million Armenians were killed under the Ottoman sword all fall under the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Among others, this convention, which was adopted by Resolution 260, precisely stipulates that genocide includes two forcibly transferred children of the group to another group which was the case for these Armenian orphans in Antura, Lebanon. The orphanage has since returned to its original use as a learning institute now known as the St. Joseph College, Sarah Huri, Future Television, Beirut. This is Jamal Pasha's grandson, Hassan Jamal. In 2008, during the football game, he visited Dizayn Agape in Armenia, and as you can see, he's laying carnations over there. <coughs> I have been able to get land in Antura's college to expand the cemetery there, and God willing, in end of September, we'll be able to put the Khachkar there, and I'm working on inviting Hassan Jemal on the opening of that cemetery. This is Robert Fisk, a writer and journalist for Middle East correspondent of The Independent. In March 2010, he wrote an excellent article on two pages on The Independent he told me if you pay $10 million to the independent, they will not publish two pages like this. He was able to publish it, and it was translated to Korean, Japanese, Hebrew, Arabic, French, you name it. The headline read, Living Proof of the Armenian Genocide, and he invited President Barack Obama and his blind Secretary of State Hillary Clinton 
who are now campaigning so beautifully to prevent the US Congress acknowledging that the Ottoman Turkish massacres of one and a half million Armenian was a genocide, should come here to this Lebanese hilltop village and hang their heads in shame. Once he published this article, I got in touch with a bunch of very smart Armenian producers. And you're going to see a film in a minute. But something very interesting happened with Robert Fisk. We went there on Sunday, and they gave us authority to get in, inside. But we didn't have the key for the cemetery. And it, it is like on a hill, and the cemetery, cemetery is downstairs. And I told Robert, it's right there, and I gave him all the archive uh, material uh, from uh, Ottoman, uh, French, American, and Armenian archives, saying it's there. He says, no, I got to go down. I said, it's locked. He says, I will climb. I don't care. At his age, he tried to climb and the high rocks. And at the end, I virtually carried him. And I was, as I was carrying him, and I said, my God, if he falls down, what the heck I'm going to say to other people that I dropped Robert Fisk? <laughs> but I didn't understand why he insisted he wanted to go on the cemetery. Apparently, that was not his first time being on a mass Armenian grave. And here is a film on a and &E In the oil-rich desert near Deir ez an even worse fate awaited the survivors of the marches. Called hidden Here the Turks set up what can only be called extermination camps. The Armenians could look forward to a slow death through starvation and ill use, or a quicker, more horrible one through burning. And they were taking my aunt, one of my aunts were <laughs> living, she said, 600 children, they took me to, they put in a place and put gas on, on top of us, and they knew they put fire and they all died. And like me, there were five gendarmes, five girls, they put us on the back of their horses, they sold us to the Bedouins, to the Arabs. And that's why she said, I am alive. The rest, they were burning and we were screaming, crying. I think they didn't have any conscience. They didn't have any heart. I don't know how, because she was older than me. I don't know how they did such things. Into these caves were tipped literally thousands of women and children who survived the marches. Only a handful lived to tell the tale of this subterranean Auschwitz. <laughs> One morning they told us we would get some food. But they took everyone except the women and children behind the hill and then they murdered them. Then the Turks began to rape and torture the women. Four girls held each other by the hand and jumped in the river. Did those of you who survived have to march on? Only 3,000 survived. We were all later thrown into a cave and burned alive. Some of us managed to hide in a tunnel inside the cave. Fifteen women and I climbed out of the cave three days later. So only ten to fifteen people survived. Yes, the others were burned to ashes. Despite the testimony of so many eyewitnesses, the Turks still insist there was no genocide. But they can't argue away the thousands of human skeletons that still exist in the desert around Deir ez -Zor. Our photographer, Isabella Sen and I, had been to see an old woman of around 100 who lived near Deir ez -Zor, an Armenian who survived the massacres. She gave us the precise location of a hill at a place called Murkada, on the Habur River, north of Deir Ezzor, about 70 miles north, where she said around 50,000 Armenians were murdered by the Turks, including her father and her two younger sisters. Following her precise instructions, we found the hill. It wasn't easy because the river had changed course in the course of the last 70 years. What did happen, however, 
is that the rains of this winter had cut into the hill of Murgada, a place which was known even to the local Syrian police as being a, a place of darkness, as one of them put it. And when we went into one of these fissures, cracks in the hill, um, Isabel was the first one to brush her hand against the side of the earth. And as she did so, she revealed a human skull. And I turned around and started brushing with my hand on the other side of the earth. And two entire skeletons interlocked, pushed, into, pushed together, um, were revealed, uh, backbone, head, in some cases, we got the impression that they must have been tied together. And indeed, the story of the massacre at that place was that the men and women were tied together by the Turks. The Armenians were tied together, pushed into the river, and one of them would be shot and would drag the others down to their deaths. The others would drown. And, and what we had in fact found, of course, was a mass grave. And it was quite chilling to realize as we went on uncovering more and more skulls that we literally took out in our hands, that, that we were at the scene of the century's first Holocaust. The Turkish government's denial that this genocide happened is similar, parallel, in some ways identical to the denial of neo-Nazis when they say that the Nazi Holocaust against the Jews never happened. It is here that I understood why Robert Fisk insisted on going down and looking at the cemetery because he has been previously on other mass grave. So after his article, this documentary was prepared on Ventura. One of those centers was recently unveiled by Maurice Kalashian, a Silicon Valley electrical engineer who by conducting both primary and secondary research techniques was able to conclude that the building that is currently used by Antura Lazarite College in Lebanon was once occupied by a thousand Armenian genocide orphans. This orphanage was the brainchild of Ahmad Jamal Pasha, one of the architects of the Armenian genocide. And as I went to the archives, I found that the French uh, leaders or, or the French priests, the Lazarus priests, they have written that there have been 1,200 orphans in that orphanage and most of them were Armenians and about 200 of them were both Turks and Kurds and their names have been changed by keeping their initials and given Muslim names and after that boys were circumcised and completely taught Turkish and Ottoman culture to make them forget their identity. Jamal Pasha appoints Halide Adib, a prominent feminist in Turkey, as the directress of the orphanage. Halide Adib narrates in her autobiography, printed in 1926, that sometimes in the middle of the meals, when the children seems happiest, one of the little ones would suddenly begin to cry. It was a screaming, cutting cry, which lasted for hours, no doubt caused by some association with their home. Also that one felt that these children, whatever happened, would carry something crippled, something mutilated in them. The Independent publishes an article signed by the award-winning British journalist Robert Fisk under the title of Living Proof of the Armenian Genocide. There, Mr. Fisk explains Mr. Kalashian's findings in detail. How Mr. Kalashian was able to trace a photo in a rare book called Lions of Mirage, written by Near East Relief volunteer Stanley Kerr. That photo was traced back to the Antura College in Lebanon. Here, Mr. Kalashian is standing where once stood Jamal Pasha, surrounded by Halide Adib and his entourage. Old archives in the library of Antura College, including photos, handwritten documents, and memorabilia, prompted Mr. Kalashian to yet another discovery, the memoirs of Kernig Panian, one of the Antura orphans. 
Karikarian, who was given the number 551 as his identity in the orphanage, was six years old when he arrived at Antura in 1916. In his memoirs, he writes, at every sunset, in the presence of over 1,000 orphans, when the Turkish flag was lowered, long live General Pasha was recited. That was the first part of the ceremony. And after that, the children were, the messy children would have to be punished of what they have done. So kids of three, four, five years old, they've been punished in Falakha. Falakha is using, it was the known Ottoman uh, way of punishing by hitting uh, children or adults under the soles of their feet. Amicia de Sir Uzin were pokrik, the bar gets a name Kedina, what carried the telling in Falakai Korziki match, Korzikin, Yerguz Ire and Pernaz, the bar Satsane, Ferzi Bay, Kasan Ink, Harvaz Nerga de Hatsaner, Anir Evagali Anka Tutian, Pokrige, Gekalar Ver, Gejachar, Mama, Mama, Myrenin Miraz, Myrenin Okutian Gancherov, Maraz Vijagi Mets, Ivan Tanots Gedarve. And every time they said hi there, mama or baba or any Armenian word, the punishment was a falakha of a minimum 25 stripes under the sole of feet, children of 3, 4, 5, up to 14 years old. <coughs> Out of the 1,000 Armenian children at Artura Orphanage, 456 survived. Hundreds of them died due to the deplorable conditions of the orphanage. The remains of over 300 orphans were discovered in 1993, when the Lazarite fathers dug the foundations for new classrooms. What was left of the remains were moved respectfully to the little cemetery where the college's priest lie buried and put in a single deep mass grave. the cemetery that we're going to be expanding and putting the Khachkar in a few months and hopefully I'll be able to convince Hassan Jamal to come in and uh, the famous Kohar Symphony Orchestra is going to be there with 150 members and the other thing that I did also Karnik Panyan as you saw is a famous personality, an old personality who also become the Jemaran High School uh, uh, principal. I was able to take about 160 boys and girls, ages from 7, 8, and 9th grade, to remember those children which have been forgotten. Since 2005, I have spoken on many radios and TVs and newspapers, and I have asked the Armenian community, we have found the remains of about 300 Armenian kids. We should put something there. We should put a plaque, a khachkar, or anything. And since 2005, nothing happened. So after waiting for five years, I took, I decided to follow up on that and do it myself. Because it's not always that Turks don't look after us. Many times we don't look after us as well. The Lexus film is called Armenian Suffering and Christian Aid. It is credited to the Dr. Lepsis Deutsch Orient, uh, Orient Mission in Potsdam, Germany, and, it's re, uh, and it's, the film is located in the Bundes Archive in Berlin. This film was sent to me by the director of Armenian Genocide Museum Institute in Armenia, Mr. Haik Demoya and the Near East Foundation Chairman, Mr. Shant Mardirosian, to study and identify the locations in this film. As an expert in the photographic material related to the Armenian Genocide. The film is silent, but it includes descriptive captions in German, which I have translated into English, and will be reading them for you. I have also added background music to the film. Although this film is silent, ironically, it is the most eloquent narrator of the Armenian Genocide. 
and the most powerful factual proof of the reality of the Armenians who were perished and of the ones who courageously survived. Through this incredible rare recording, I wanted to share with you not only the reality of the genocide as it was unfolding, but also brilliant images of precious moments from the lives of brave survivors who are the parents and grandparents of most of us in this audience today. I also wanted to share with you the fact that 8,000 kids, as well as other older survivors, were determined to make it barefooted to Syria and Lebanon and became productive, successful members of the local communities. This was possible not just, just because of a certain orphanage or an organization provided them with food, clothing, and shelter, but because dedicated workers selflessly and indiscriminately created an intelligent, nurturing, nurturing safe environment for all the survivors, encouraging their individual freedom and the discipline of playing, working, and creating together to survive and grow as communities. <coughs> the refugee camps are long gone, and the orphanages are long gone now, because the orphans became businessmen, traders, doctors, lawyers, mechanics, nurses, engineers. We currently have Lebanese Armenian members of parliament, ministers, and great community leaders. We also have churches, schools, even an incredible institution such as the Haigazian University. Although it is a very important to understand the experience of the survivors of the genocide, my story is not a sad story filled with human tragedy, treason, and destruction. My story is a story of survival against all odds, against the unbearable and the unimaginable. It is about the will to live, help, create, and produce. It is also about the courage of understanding the historic truth by the grandson of Jamal Pasha, expressed to his placing flowers at the Armenian Genocide Memorial, apologizing for the shameful act carried by his grandfather and his partners. It is a story about love, humanity, and dedication beyond normal limits. This is a story about showing people's respect and giving, that, uh, giving them back their dignity so that they can continue their journey with their chin up and their shoulders straight. What about you're gonna, about to see now is all the stories you have heard from your parents, grandparents, grand-grandparents, and it has been a story up in the clouds for you. But you're going to be seeing now how it was in a documentary film. During the years of 1915 and 16, one and a half million Armenian Christians, mostly the old women and children, were driven towards the Arabian Desert. This is where they made them walk. Round and round, barefooted, raping, killing, no water, up to 120, 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Hundreds of thousands were to die here during the World War. These are the translation from German. Barefooted in this desert, they made them walk and walk round and round until they were exhausted, killed, raped. Thousands of children were transported from the dangerous regions to the safety of Syria. 8,000 children belonged by the missionary Jack of Consular. The 
American Navy's relief, barefooted kids, over 1,000 miles they had to walk. They could have come by vessels only 150 kilometers or 100 miles. They brought them near the river. They didn't allow them to drink. Exhausted, they died. The same stories you have heard from your parents and grandparents. This is a Malapa. How many of those remaining could be saved from certain death was the great question. These are our people. Look at the girl on the left. She's trying to, afraid, praying. The war for bread. The children were first gathered in front of the gates of the mission homes. They were clothed and fed, and wood was given to the working adults. And I said, wood. Clothing was given to them, and after that, food and wood. I wondered why it was the wood for. Then I found out when they arrived, they arrived and lived under tents. And then the missionaries, and the American missionaries, gave them wood so they can build their villas. You will see the villas. But notice how significantly there are no men. The one with the fences that you see are Lebanese or, seven, uh, or Syrian workers who are helping to give wood for the family. A mother with a child, each one carrying couple of plywood. Whole colonies of rescued refugees arose in Syria. This is an Aleppo. Twenty-two thousand orphans were rescued and taken to Greece and kept by the American Relief Organization at the feet of the Acropolis and on the island of Syra. Under the Acropolis. Where are the parents? Tell me, how did these children come to the world? The Greek government donated land and building material on the island of Syra and the boys built their own orphan, orphanage with a garden and classroom. Here they are, the boys building their own orphanages, the girls doing their part as well. And others working in gardens to pro make produce. The assembly of the orphan to give them identity, no parents, look at their ages, have them talk in front of their friends so that they restart their life again. <coughs> Probably saying, hi, yes, hi, yes, kachvartani, tornamias. 
The whole crowd of thousand must be fed daily in Syria. So too in 18,000 in Alexandrople, Armenia. This is on Sierra Island in Greece. Look at these. Where are the parents? These had fields, villas, lands. They had maids. And here they are eating on the floor. This is in Alexandrople, the largest orphanage in the world. At this point, it was 18,000. It reached the top 30,000 orphans. Now think about it for a second. These children have to eat three times a day. They have to wash. They have to have combs, pillows, jackets. It's cold. It's in humidity. They were so big. Their table was over two miles long. You will see in a minute. Look at that. By the time they start from one side, the food will end before it reaches the other side. And they will take turns. Armenian orphans also appear in the Holy Land. Jerusalem. Panoramic view of Jerusalem. The mission rescued many of the Armenian girls from the harems. Look at them, how nice they are wearing their skirts and they are clean and trying to restart a new world after seeing horrific things. In the orphanage of Nazareth, through the mission, the boys get trained in useful trades. At Ghazir in Lebanon, the girls' orphanage of Dr. Lapsis German Orient Mission, where children were educated in school and learned weaving and carpet making. As you saw earlier on my research was in 2005-2006. I did the research, I found the carpet, followed it up up to the White House, and you know, take a better photo and all that. But I never imagined to see the girls working on the carpet. Who knows what story each child, boy and girl have? Look at here. They're working on the carpet. And don't you think it's an easy job? You will see how hard they have to work. dreams in a carpet and gave it to the White House out of their tragedy as a thank you for the U.S. government. They had to fed, they had to work, they had to clean, go to school, learn. They had also to dance, to forget their pains, to work as a group. High treatment in the orphanages because there was a lot of disease and a lot of blind people which were the kids from the pillows and uncleanness of trachoma was very bad.
in the courtyard of the orphanage in Zazir. Now this is the water fountain I showed you where the girl we broadcast. It's the same one. Oh. <laughs> This is Papa Kunstler, the Swiss missionary who started in Urfa. As you can see here, he lost his right arm. <coughs> Dr. Lepsis asked him to go to Urfa after the 1895-96 massacres. He stayed all the time there. In 1915, he was there and uh, all the time. And he was the one who spearheaded for the Near East Relief to move 8,000 children barefooted, walking, and some mules and stuff, to bring them to Aleppo, Syria, and Lebanon. One day, he was going to attend a funeral, and they called him because he was a kind of a medic, to look after the girl. He looked, and he gave his instructions, and Without washing his hand, he went out and he slipped on the floor and some, uh, uh, when he fell down, and he did like this on his hand, and then he had gangrene from, he got from the girl, and he had, they had to cut his right arm. His lo he lost his, one of his precious arms, <coughs> all the way from Urfa to Harper, walking to Syria and Lebanon, and instead of going to his homeland in Switzerland, like Maria Jacobson, the, uh, the Danish missionary, they preferred to die with their orphans. He's buried in Lebanon. <coughs> Go ahead, jump, forget your pain. Dance in a group. After work is done, a group of stroll by the camp where they once languished. Many more stay behind here that envy to go out of the orphanages. This is the view from Ghazir to Bay of Junior. Look at the ages. No mother, no father, no family love. They taught them crafts, how to shoemaking, carpentry, so they can survive on their own. Weaving, tailoring, needling. They used to sell these in Europe, in the States, so they can party. Brass words. Christmas box from Postan, the headquarters of the mission, is received by the orphan's father, Kunzler. His daughter, Marie, distributes tasks among the children. We got cars, multi houses, boats, planes, whatever. All these, we, for those two boxes, look at their happens. Because they were happy that somebody from Germany is thinking of them. This is their Christmas tree in the back. They're getting gifts. They're probably dancing and clapping their hands, probably not knowing what they're doing. Beirut with the Marmachael Armenian refugee camp. This is the panoramic view of 
as you can see here, these are the houses or the villas that I call, because you will see later on at these places where they were living under tents, and the wood that you saw earlier, they brought them and then they built those tin houses, and later you're going to see from inside how they look. This is Mar Mukhayel refugee camp, the biggest one in Beirut then. You see the background port of Beirut, and it was near the main train station. As you can see, the rail. Many people are snatched away from death through Christian charity, but in the struggle for survival, tens of thousands yet wrestle to survive. This is again in Beirut, at the seafront, near the electricity building, if any of you know where that. The refugee camp in Beirut on the east coast of the Mediterranean Sea looks picturesque from distance, but in reality contains screaming misery. Shacks made of crate wood and sheet metal harbor 12,000 refugees. Laundry hanging everywhere in the wind testifies to a strong sense of cleanliness. This is how they lived when they arrived. From here they became businessmen, lawyers, doctors, professors, engineers, etc., etc. This is inside the camp. barracks were built in less than one square kilometer for more than 20,000 people. But what do we know? The Turks say nothing happened. Why are you These are the villas, these are the wood they used to build the houses. For the numerous youth, the threat of neglect is great in the narrow streets of the barracks. The young in the cradle also are a cause for worry and hope for the parents. A couple of generations living together in one spot. as seen from inside the hut. <laughs> this is their oven. In the streets, we see bakers, barbers, and coppersmiths at work. The streets are disinfected. Also, there is a similar refugee camp 
the Lantaiter Nefsa's German Orient Mission has built small homes there for the widows and orphans. It was called the Widow Colony. 